Okay, um, this is uh, a presentation that's extremely fascinating to me, and I, I know much of it to be a fact. I've been involved with some of it, and I know the guy that's doing it, and if he says it's true, it's true. Uh, he's been done a lot of research on this stuff since 30, 40 years, longer than I have for sure. He's written several books, and some of them are here for sale. Uh, the, the newest book is Shape Power. He's going to talk about that and tie it all in with how all this stuff comes to be. Uh, his name is Dan Davidson, and uh, he's here from Sierra Vista with his wife, Janine, and uh, <laughs> she's going to be doing his slides. Dan, if you'll come up. Did he disappear? Oh, oh, come on. <laughs> Hand for Dan. Well, if, if I had a correlated my speech with Jerry... I wouldn't uh, repeat some of the stuff he said, so you're going to see a little bit of uh, repeat here, but uh, maybe you can uh, forgive us. The, the, this is truly the, the, the fringe area. Can you get closer here? I can't hear you. Isn't this a great conference? Yeah, everybody have fun? Yeah. yeah. Welcome to the uh, lunatic fringe of science. <laughs> if you think Jerry's crazy, this is going to be a little crazier. Okay, gravitational resonant effects. I've been interested in this stuff, like Jerry says, for quite a while. I'm probably one of the uh, chief geezer status on all these crazy things. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, I met a guy named uh, Larry Wilson. I'd read this book uh, on flying saucers have landed by uh, Leslie and Adamski. And that's how I got started on this. The first half of the book was by Desmond Leslie, and it was an excellent book on... Uh, research and had John Keeley, Tesla, a bunch of crazy things like that in it. And this to me was the, the new area of science. Now this, remember, was about 45 years ago. So it was quite a while. And uh, so I, I, I figured, well, the stuff I'm learning in uh, high school at that time was, uh, was just uh, kid stuff, you know? So when I got to college, I was gonna learn the, the pure quill. But when I got to college, it was more of the same. So I carried on a full-time research along with uh, my college stuff, and I started meeting some really fantastic people. And one of the guys I met uh, was a guy named Larry Wilson, who actually had free energy and anti-gravity devices working. He'd never tell me how they work, but he'd always feed me bits and pieces of stuff. And the, the first book I wrote was basically a lot of the bits and pieces put together that all held uh, some credence as far as what I could come up with. Uh, and then from there on, uh, I continued to do uh, quite a bit of research, and one of my big areas was the conversion of the ether directly into usable energy and usable uh, gravitational forces. Now, Jerry's touched on this quite a bit with uh, Grabenikov. I'm going to hit on that again and uh, talk about a little bit about the theory, and, and possibly we have uh, identified the insect, at least I think I have. Now, maybe that's not true, but it's a good possibility, and it does fit uh, with some of the stuff that Jerry's been doing. Uh, next slide. Oh, this one here. Uh, in, in my Shape Power book, which was published uh, three or four years ago, I talked about uh, the definition of what shape power is. And basically, it's the conversion where physical shapes will convert the ether into uh, other forces, like gravity, uh, magnetism, electronics, uh, nuclear forces. And this was the basic concept that I'd been working on for quite a few years. And a lot of these things like uh, Hendershot and Keeley and, and uh, Tesla and all this stuff that I'd studied were to try and figure out some way to make all of this happen where we'd have usable forces from shape power effects. The basic uh, shape power discovery was uh, really came together when I was, uh, on, it was about seven, year, seven, or seven or about seven or eight years ago. And there was a, uh, a discussion I was uh, reviewing on uh, the pyramid effects. I'd been uh, fascinated with pyramid energy for quite a while. I discussed it somewhat in the very first book I did. And uh, I was wondering why, if you, all you need to make pyramid energy uh, work is to have the outline frame of the pyramid. And so I reasoned from that that there must be something happening within the atomic structure of, of each of these uh, edges of the pyramid that are interacting to create some kind of a force field effect. And what I came up with is that the, if you take a look at all the atoms with, within a line within a pyramid, 
one of the edges, all of those atoms are interacting with the local uh, ether. They're in, in Jerry touched on this a bit with the, the idea of inertia, which is the resistance of mass to moving through the ether because it's already entrained in one spot. So when you get it moving, it wants to stay moving in that effect because you've got the, the ether moving through it. Uh, so what I did was I thought, well, if you take two, two lines of energy, like this right here, then these, these ether entrainment should start interacting down here at the vertex of these two intersecting lines. And I knew from all of the uh, uh, unified field theory that I'd put together that basically this should be a magnetic field and it should be measurable. And I figured, well, if, if a one-dimensional thing would do this, maybe three-dimensional would work better. And that's basically what you got in the pyramid is you got a three-dimensional effect. Next. So I didn't have a really a sensitive uh, magnetic measurement device at that time, I, but I have a friend uh, named Joe Parr, who I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And Joe had a uh, uh, alpha trifield meter, and it will measure very sensitive magnetic fields. And so I called Joe up and I said, hey, Joe, uh, how about doing a little experiment for me to see if we can generate a magnetic field without any metal? He says, well, that sounds interesting. Is what he got in mind. So I, I explained the experiment. I wanted to put something together, uh, non-magnetic, maybe a piece of woods or something, and uh, have them all come into a point and see if we can measure a magnetic field and possibly a uh, electrostatic field. So Joe's, uh, Joe's wife is uh, Chinese, and uh, they have a lot of chopsticks around the house because uh, they have a lot of Chinese food. So uh, Joe said, well, I'll take some chopsticks. So he stuck a whole bunch of chopsticks into a styrofoam ball, and he took his meter and measured it. And lo and behold, he came up with uh, nine chopsticks, would generate a 250 volt per meter field. And one inch from the ball, he was getting one millitesla. And of course, away from the ball, he wasn't getting anything. So this really validated the effect for me. So this started me off. I built a flux gate magnetometer, which was even more sensitive than the one that Jerry did. And the Shape Power book is kind of a compilation of all of the shapes and, and anal analysis that we did to come up with the uh, theory and the, the concepts and how different shapes modify the local ether. And most of the things that I talked about in the uh, Shape Power book were two-dimensional figures. Uh, we didn't get a lot into the three-dimensional stuff except for the, the pyramid and a, and a cup and a cone. But basically, we had proven uh, in the lab that basic shape can convert the ether into other forces. And if, if you take these, uh, for example, the, put the pyramid, the pyramid itself has a magnetic field that it's generating at each of the corners as well as the vortex. And because of these fields all opposing each other, it's creating a, another void in the center, which is kind of a neutral center. And then if you stimulate this thing, or even, even non-stimulated, there's a vortex coming off the top because of the local stimulation of these other uh, five corners. So that was all measured in the lab. And Jerry mentioned this uh, picture that they had of a, hooking up a, a Tesla coil over a pyramid and, and getting a, a very large uh, double helix uh, energy field off of that off the point of the pyramid, and that photograph happens to be on the Shape Power book, if you're interested. So one of the areas that, uh, that interested me quite a bit was the idea that there are, uh, if you could take one pyramid or one array or one uh, geometric object and multiply it a number of times, you could multiply the effects. And if you come up with this, there's some, some heuristics that, that fell out of this. Arrays of shape power devices multiply the total effect by the total number of repetitions you've got of the energy shape. And the size of the material, the shape, the size of the shape is immaterial. One of the things that uh, Joe Parr discovered and, and uh, my friend Larry Wilson had mentioned, but I'd never discussed any proof of it, was that a small pyramid, no matter what the size, had the same amount of energy as the Great Pyramid in Egypt. Doesn't entrain the same amount of volume, but it has this, the same kind of an energy matrix and the same amount of power that you can pull off of it. So, if you could take 
And if a, if a pyramid has a, a total energy of one, say, six pyramids in an array would have a, a total power of at least six. And it turns out that if you arrange them in a certain way, like I showed in that previous picture, you'll actually get more energy out of it than that. So you get a multiplication a synergistic effect by array structures. And this is just a, an extrapolation. If you have a billion of atomic sized pyramids, you'd have a billion times more energy, that sort of thing. The implications of arrays. Gravitation. Too fast. Back up one. That's, I don't know, maybe we got something out of sync here. It's implications of arrays. Anyway, I'll just read it. Uh, gravitation of a singular shape produces minute gravitational effects. Then a large uh, array will multiply that effect. Same way with free energy. If you get a, a single shape that'll produce some kind of a free energy phenomena, then uh, shapes in an array will produce a, a macro effect multiplied by the number of shapes. So if you can get down into nanostructures, which is getting down uh, into the atomic uh, level and can make uh, arrays, you can have tremendous multiplication effects uh, with a very small piece of material and get free energy or anti-gravity or something out of it. And I think that's what uh, Jerry was moving to with the Gerbenikov uh, material. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, another area that, that I got into was uh, de detecting uh, the universal energy Unit, detecting the ether, detecting the various phenomena that go on within the ether. And I had uh, talked uh, several times uh, at the TESA conference about using uh, dielectrics. A very high dielectric will actually measure the stress within an etheric field. And you can measure the amount of change that the various, uh, like the sun and the moon, have effects on it. You can, you can see what kind of effects that the uh, like the electrostatic field will, uh, will affect it. And these are kind of, there's a whole gamut of energies that an affected dielectric. And you got to back out the ones, like you got to back out temperature effects, you got to back out uh, electrostatic effects before you can get the real, uh, the answers. And some people have attempted to duplicate some of my experiments and claim they didn't work, they were temperature sensitive. I said, yeah, your, your experiment's temperature sensitive because you didn't back out the temperature effects to really measure the etheric stresses. And you can do this quite easily if you, if you uh, run the experiment in con conjunction with uh, taking, you know, like a thermometer running side by side, you can back out the actual temperature effects on it. And these effects are well known within uh, electrostatics. Uh, anyway, when I published this interesting uh, uh, aspect of detecting uh, etheric stresses, I got a letter from a guy named Joe Parr, who's, who lives in California. And uh, so I started c uh, carrying on a, a voluminous uh, mail. He doesn't want to get on the internet. He doesn't want to mess with computers very much or anything. You can't hardly drag him near a computer. But he will get on his typewriter and tap out letters once in a while. So I ended up with a sheaf of letters about this thick between the two of us and trying to figure out what Joe was really talking about, because I knew he had discovered some really interesting stuff. And what he did was he had duplicated what I had done many years before. Like, he's been there and done that, found better ways to do it, and moved on. So naturally, I was interested in learning from Joe Parr. One of the things he found uh, was that uh, shape is an uh, energy sensor. Next one. Not cueing my wife very good here. <laughs> That's it. Anyhow, uh, Joe Parr developed several energy, pardon? Is that it? Yeah, perfect. Uh, to quantify pyramid energy. And one of the things he did was he developed a, a gamma ray transducer. And what he did was he embedded uh, a gamma ray source inside of a pyramid and then did various things to try and measure it. And he found out that different times of the year, the uh, field or the, the amount of radiation from that gamma ray source would vary. And 
he did this for several years and it slowly died down and kind of went away and he, he wondered what was going on. So well, he figured, well, the Great Pyramid's sitting there moving across, you know, move, the Earth's moving and it's moving. Maybe if I put pyramids and rotate them, they'll uh, magnify the effect and he'll be able to start measuring it again. So he discovered doing this that a pyramid has a spherical force field around it and that at certain times of the year, this force field is totally opaque to all local forces. It's, it's opaque to gravity, radiation, electromagnetics, uh, inertia, everything. It's a totally self-contained force field. And he was able to measure this in the lab and prove it uh, using some of these uh, exotic uh, measurement techniques. The force field, uh, what this did was it led to uh, this, the possibility of using the pyramid shape or something like a shape power array or something as a true space drive. Next one. The centrifuge. This was uh, the, the experiment where he was rotating the pyramids at the end of a, an array at very high speed. This is a, uh, what he called his centrifuge. And a centrifuge because it's circular and spinning something in it. I guess that's why he called it that. But what you see here is, is there's a balsa rod here with some pyramids, uh, epoxy, two pyramids epoxied on each end of the rod. Uh, this thing up here is a, uh, a special motor, and it's, it's far enough away from the uh, experimental apparatus down here so that the fields around the motor don't affect it. And then all the way around the outside of this, uh, centrifuge on the inside of it are these uh, magnets very precisely aligned and spaced with respect to the pyramid that flows through it. And I discussed the alignment and everything in the Shape Hour book, and, but so I'm not going to get into that. But anyhow, what he found was that at certain times of the year when this thing was, he would spin this thing continuously all during the year, and at certain times of the year these, these pyramids would fly off and, and rip up this big huge chamber. This thing is about three and a half, four feet across. And uh, so he, he, he set up a, some elaborate ways of measuring the amount of energy, and he found out that he was getting over 100,000 times increase in kinetic energy with these little pyramids based uh, over and above the rotational inertia of, uh, velocities that he was spinning this thing as. Well, the centrifuge led to... Uh, the possibility that maybe you don't need a three-dimensional pyramid to do this. So he came up with a new experiment that replaced the large centrifuge assembly. And what it was is a small, specially designed wheel uh, spun on a shaft with a small high-speed motor. What it is, here's the little motor, here's the shaft, and here's, a, here's the, the little disc. On the end of these discs, uh, these are uh, plastic discs with uh, copper uh, teeth all the way around it, much like a saw blade. And they rotate uh, in and out. There's, these are uh, spaced magnets again, very low power magnets, very low power. And they're north, south, south, north, all the way around this thing. And he would sit this thing up and run it on top of a scale. And when he built this one, uh, he got it running and seemed to be having some results, and he asked me if I would duplicate it. Well, I was not about to duplicate the centrifuge. He'd spent about $40,000 on that centrifuge. But this experiment, I could build up and get it running as, as far as my own lab equipment goes. So I built it, and, and basically, we both ran this experiment simultaneously. He's in California, I'm in Arizona. And we came up with uh, similar results, only spaced by the amount of time that it takes for the, the Earth to rotate between the two, two locations on the Earth. Uh, the experiment, when it was first running, and this is what I discussed in the, one of the first talks I gave on this stuff, was that this, this experiment was triggered by putting an electrostatic uh, negative ion source up here, and, and the, the experiment would absorb these and cause anergravitic effects. Well. A lot of people were complaining that, that it was strictly an electrostatic effect, even though it was happening at the same time in California and Arizona. So he came up with another way of stimulating it. And he found out that uh, 
what he reasoned was that the, here's, here's the Great Pyramid. I don't know if any of you have been in it. One of the reasons Jerry and I and Joe Parr went to, uh, to Egypt was to take a look at the pyramid structures and, and see what's going on in there. And we found, uh, if, if you've ever done any research on the, the Great Pyramid, there's chambers within the pyramid that are nothing like you would expect to find in a, a tomb where they would put a pharaoh or anything like this. And the, the uh, distances and everything are precisely cut within this Great Pyramid. So what Joe did was being an uh, acoustic engineer, uh, he took the measurements of the king's chamber and his boss has a, a computer program that will compute the acoustic properties of the room. So he computed the, compu the acoustic properties of the king's chamber and came up with a number of uh, frequencies. Now he knew that these weren't precisely right because there's a open sarcophagus, a big, uh, uh, I think it's uh, granite, uh, granite sarcophagus in there that's, that's empty. And so he knew it was his, his frequencies that he got from the computation would be close, but not real close. So what he did was he set up an experiment and stimulated the, uh, this ex the experiment with some sound waves, slowly raising the frequency uh, a quarter of a hertz every two days. So here's a, an example of being excruciating, excruciatingly precise in trying to find an effect. Well, when he finally got up and got something, uh, some good uh, anti-gravity effects, they happened to be, the best one was at 51.287 hertz. Now, I don't know if you know anything about the Great Pyramid, but the base angle of the Great Pyramid is 51.287 degrees. Strange correlation, right? So this is the sonic version of the uh, gravity wheel experiment. Here's the experiment with the wheel spinning in, in between the magnets. Uh, it's got a little signal generator here generating the precise frequency. This, this outfit here that could, was selling these generators, they would program up, and it's basically a PIC microcontroller uh, set up to generate this frequency, but they went out of business, so you, you can, you'd probably have to generate the thing yourself. Then it goes through a little uh, audio amplifier and drives a couple speakers that are imp imp uh, opposed to each other across here. So you've got a standing wave set up across this thing. And they're basically putting an etheric stress across the whole experiment. And this whole thing sets on a very precise, accurate scale. And I've got all this equipment here. I'm going to demonstrate it tomorrow if you're still around. Anyhow, this, this experiment was run for several years uh, and correlated with all the other data. And in the Shape Power book, I discuss all the correlations. Uh, but one of the most interesting things that we found out was that the, uh, at certain times of the year, this experiment would attempt to go, an would go anagravitic and try to lift off of the scale. And you could measure this very precisely. And they always occurred about the same time of the year. The biggest uh, amount of anagravity effects that we would see were around December 15th to January 5th or 8th, right in that uh, time frame. And it turns out that the Great Pyramid, if you uh, correlate back about 10,500 years ago, one of the, uh, two, two of the chambers that, that shoot out through the uh, pyramid to the outside, if you run a line from them, they were pointing at, uh, Alpha Orionis, which is one of the uh, stars in Orion's belt. And the other one is pointed at uh, Draconius, I believe. This was 10,500 years ago. Not now it's not doing it. So what happens is, is as the uh, Earth moves to that precise point in the Earth's orbit, we're lined up at January 15th to about the uh, or December 15th to, to January 8th with those stars in Orion's belt. They come right straight overhead. And so what we had deduced was that the Earth is going through some kind of energy conduit that exists between our sun and some of those stars in Orion's belt. And it turns out that there's all kinds of other correlations that exist with respect to the Great Pyramid and, and this star system that's uh, back from Egyptian uh, mythology and, and that and some of the history of the Great Pyramid itself. So we at that point 
I was still working a lot on my array ideas, and uh, we, I started looking for natural array structures where we might be able to get these kind of effects, because natural arrays, if they were at the nanostructure or at the atomic level, could be useful as a possible free energy or anti-gravity device. And if you got looking in nature, of course, uh, crystals are repetitive arrays of basic atomic arrangement. But that's strictly because down at the exact atomic level because the atoms are hooked together in a crystalline arrangement. Uh, if you get into, for example, the, the fine-grained structure of, of the brain, there are some structures within the brain that happen to be stacked conics, which could possibly be parametric amplifiers based on the shape power research we've done. If you look at the leaves on a tree, uh, you've got line structures, webbings. This goes down, if you look at it under a microscope, you still get the, this, this uh, webbing effect of, of lines coming together in a point, which means that leaves are probably tapping uh, into the energy, the zero point energy and, and creating energies that the uh, tree operates on. If you look at cells in trees and plants, uh, they're cellulose, they have a, a repetitive structure and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. William Relic was the discoverer of Oregon Energy, and uh, I think it was just another name for the ether myself. He discovered that different materials will conduct the orgone at different rates. For example, natural materials like silk wool and uh, wood and things like that will all readily conduct the etheric energies or the orgone energies. Metals like iron and zinc tend to act as slower transmitters. And then some of the research I did, we discovered that all synthetic plastics and plastic materials do not conduct the ether to any large extent. And, the, and this, this is not the kind of ether that uh, they're talking about with this high-powered Im impulse energy, which seems to shatter through everything. So the speculation that I have is that uh, the random structure uh, of uh, plastics is such that it's not conducive to the conduction of, uh, of the ether. The next thing was Grabenikov. Uh, I wanted to thank Jerry especially for providing material on this. A lot of this is going to be repetitive, so if it's boring you can go to sleep or whatever. Uh, but Jerry contacted me a couple years and said, hey, I got this wild material. And we said, oh, yeah, right, and some more stuff. You know, we get things all the time that are pretty woo-woo. And this is woo-woo, let me tell you. Jerry has already proven that. Uh, <laughs> I thought you'd like that. <laughs> anyway, uh, Brganikoff is 75 years old. Jerry said he was 73. I'm not sure, you know, somewhere in that vicinity. He's a scientist, a naturalist, a professional entomologist, gifted painter. Uh, he's currently very ill, uh, probably dying. And he spent about 60 years studying insects and insect secrets. He's well known within the uh, scientific underground, uh, underground in quotes, uh, community within uh, Russia. In other words, he's, he's respected by a lot of scientists, but he's not a, an actual uh, degreed scientist from what we know. He developed a, a book, which is an extensive uh, biography as well as a work on entomology and a lot of his revelations and things that he came up with in uh, shape power. And the reason I got interested in it because his discoveries paralleled mine exactly and in some areas he had gone a lot more into the three-dimensional effects. And one of the, this, is a, this has to be a translation of the book on uh, the flight. And how this all started uh, was with these uh, wasp nests. And he's, I want to read you here just a little bit so you get a little flavor of this character. He says, all this takes place on the step in the Kami Slovaki Valley. If you can pronounce it, don't ask me. <laughs> I settle in this very precipice on a grassy plot. I spread my cloak, put the rucksack under her head, before I lay down to sleep, I gather several dry cow patties, lay them together in a pile, set them alight, and the rustic, unforgettable odor of that blue haze spreads over the quiet step. 
This guy's a poet, right? <laughs> the blue haze quietly carries me to the land of fairy tales and sleep everywhere, and sleep approaches quickly. I become as tiny as an ant, and then enormous as the sky, and now sleep must come, but why all these seemingly pre-sleep transformations of my body mechanisms, though quite unusual, are so very strong? Suddenly there appeared some sort of, sort of flashing lights, but I open my eyes and the lights don't go away. They dance about the pearly silver evening sky, the grass. The sharp metallic taste comes to my mouth as if I had placed the contacts of a strong battery in my tongue. This is where he first discovered this effect. He set his cloak down on a, on a grassy knoll right above a lake, and what he discovers is that he's, he's, uh, he's on a bank, an embankment, and, the, and the, below the embankment, are all these uh, bees' nests that are built into this mud bank. And he later discovers that these bees' nests have shape power effects. And that's how he got into all of this uh, gravity and everything else with respect to the, uh, to the research that he did. Next. That's one. That's it. That's it. That's good. His initial discovery was on this field trip to southern Russia. I, I read about that. Uh, his analysis led to this mud, mud nest uh, discovery, and that the mud nests have some kind of strange energies, and the mud nests are an array of cells. And just remember this array stuff, because this happens all over in this uh, research that's going on. A lot of his, uh, Jerry's covered some of this, so I'll go through it very quickly. This is the sheaf of straws, uh, where he found out there's some energies coming off of it. Uh, a conic uh, in this particular shape will enhance energy. You put the conic energy off this way, and it'll actually cut down the growth of the uh, thing of whatever you're testing. He tested the uh, next one. Stacked cardboard egg dividers. You know, this guy is using really basic effects. If you want to play with this stuff, it's not really expensive to start playing with it. But the, these cardboard egg dividers, uh, he stacked them up and found out that they had certain healing principles. So again, you got a huge stacked array, three-dimensional. Uh, one of the things he discovered, uh, next one, was that uh, you take a fan-fold paper and stack it at slight angles between each other, uh, you end up with some uh, energy effects. These are identical to the energy effects that we discovered uh, with our instrumentation and uh, we're not sure quite how Grabenikov quanti quantized these things, but uh, perhaps he could feel them or something. That, uh, if you're sensitive, you can feel these energies quite readily. Next. One of the things that Jerry and I were both quite skeptical of when we got into this was, uh, is any of this stuff real? And I think it's quite controversial. Uh, like I said, we're treading on the lunatic fringe of science with some of this stuff. But I do think that this area has some uh, definite uh, possibilities as far as legitimate research. And due to this, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of discussion and possibly uh, point out some ways of uh, you know, theoretical background on this. Next one. Jerry had a lot better pictures of this because he's got the book. I, all I had was these uh, black and whites, but they, they still show the basic box that Grabenikovs has got. Uh, this is the thing that when it's on, he carries it around like a briefcase, and when he gets to where he's going to take off, he unfolds it and puts it all together. Next one. These are the two pictures side by side of him setting this thing on the ground and then another one where he's a few feet above the ground, uh, again from his book on my world. I've looked at some of these pictures and tried to figure out, you know, what's really going on. Is Are these really motorcycle grips type things where he's cranking something? Uh, from his discussion, it's quite possible. This, I think, might be an altimeter. Uh, there's what looks like a switch here. 
the whole thing is uh, all fits in that case, so this whole thing is lashed together with these wing nuts. Uh, down here at the base, uh, you've got some kind of a lever here. Maybe this is to turn the thing on. Uh, there's some other uh, switches or uh, some type of mechanism here that's embedded. This is a, looks like a metal plate that's bolted into this wood, piece of wood. Uh, possible foot control of some types. This is a picture of the thing in flight. Uh, you should take special note of this because I think this is very important, these lines coming down here. I think, uh, you know, Jerry didn't cover it too much, but I think this is a, a big clue as to what's going on within this little platform. I think these are lines of etheric force that he sketched coming out of this thing. What he discovered within his entomology research was that some levit uh, insects actually levitate rather than uh, fly, and this was due to this uh, chitin uh, shell-shaped thing, and it would cause uh, some kind of an anagravitic effect if you put a bunch of them together. Uh, if you go through the book, there's no indication of which insect it is, but it's possibly a beetle, a bee, or moth, uh, and Jerry mentioned a wasp, that's also another possibility because he did talk a lot about wasps. The anti-gravity effects are related to the chitinous covers. Uh, chitin is a, one of the most uh, prevalent substances on the earth other than cellulose. The, the phenomenon is attendant with uh, partial invisibility, uh, implying localized warping of the space around this thing. Uh, deformed visual perception uh, from people outside of it. And this is one of the interesting things I thought was that when he was flying over a pipe factory, it caused the scooter, grav scooter, to falter. And this is very similar to some uh, work that was done when Reich was working on his Cloud Buster stuff. Uh, a UFO appeared in, in one of his uh, days when he was doing research with the Cloud Buster, and he aimed at this Cloud Buster at the UFO, and the UFO started wobbling around like it was maybe losing some of its power or something. So I think that possibly flying over this uh, factory had some kind of an effect. Uh, the rays of pipes in the factory were causing some kind of an effect that was affecting the scooter. And it's, it's all these little clues when you add them together that lead us to believe that this is an invalid effect. Jerry mentioned it goes 920 miles an hour, very close. Uh, 25 kilometers per hour is 932 miles per hour, but, you know, big deal. Uh, he flew this thing, or gravitated it, from 1991 to 1992 as a means of high-speed travel. And he would get off of this thing, and, and uh, it, primarily he was using it to go do his entomology research and study bugs. <laughs> I can think of a lot more things I'd do with it. <laughs> next. Go ahead, next. If you go through an analysis of this thing, uh, the grab scooter is unique, and I think it warrants extensive research. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, DOD's got a couple hundred million dollars uh, and a bunch of scientists trying to run this thing down right now, especially after Jerry's posted on the bulletin board. <laughs> it's all your fault, Decker. <laughs> He mentions these chitina, I, I call it chitinous sometimes, chitinous covers covering the wings of insects that uh, create the effect. Uh, I took, we got a lot of beetles in Arizona. We get them flying into the garage. If you leave your lights on and the garage unlock uh, and a door open, and the bugs will fly in and land and, and croak. And so the next morning I pull their wings off and did some studies, and my wife won't let me bring them in the house. And so I got on her little list because of that. Uh, but anyway, one of the things he found out was that, is he, too, too fast, got to go back one, one of four. Uh, 30. I did a good job arranging these, I guess. He talked about that uh, when he was flying this thing, horizontally, the space was opening up in front of him and closing in behind. Uh, the other thing that was interesting was that he, he would have an updraft of air coming from underneath the grav scooter because he could smell the flowers and things that he was flying over with with the grav scooter. 
In the, in the translation that uh, I've, a good friend of mine has done there in uh, Arizona, uh, the grab scooter works best during the summer and tends to have a problem when it's raining. There's another little clue. Water is a known absorber of etheric energies. So if, uh, it's all these little things that add together that lead us to believe we got something going here. It may be possible that the chitin acts as a filter to block or guide the etheric energy to create natural gravity effects. Uh, I think you know, it's a good possibility it's a beetle. Uh, I got, uh, when we first started looking at this, I found somebody on the internet that uh, was collecting beetles and I bought a, a rhino beetle, which is a, a beetle that's about, I don't know, about this big around and about that high and he's got an ugly looking horn on him, but they're kind of uh, totally benign, supposedly. And, but this one was dead, and so I didn't have any problem with getting it. And what we thought was that maybe these beetle covers, he talks about this cover that acts as a uh, gravity effect transducer. And one of the, so I bought a uh, nice microscope, lab microscope, if you can get them used on the internet for a pretty good price. And I noticed uh, that the, the beetle has two wings if you want to call them wings. One is this outer wing covering, and then underneath are the are regular wings that, that come out. When he lifts these upper wings, the other ones pop out, and then the beetle flaps both of them, and he goes flying around with it. So I took a look at these uh, beetle wings underneath the microscope, and the, undersi the underside of the underneath wing has an array structure that happens to look just like this. It's, it's, the, uh, it's basically uh, spikes. Yeah, put it up. Put the next one up. Microsized spikes. These are down in the, I, don't know, I think they're 20 or 30 microns long. And uh, I tried to just sketch it there uh, with my drawing package, but it didn't come out so good, so I built this thing here to give a better example of it. But it's basically a triangular structure. It's two, two row, a uh, row, and then a row uh, shifted by uh, half the distance between them. So you end up with triangles between each of the rows, so you get maximum packing. And this is the structure that's on the underside of the wing. Now, does that sound like an aerodynamic structure to anybody? You know, why would you have little spikes sticking down underneath your wing uh, to create some kind of aer aerodynamic effect? Now, it's, it's well known within aer uh, hydrodynamics, uh, aerodynamics that if you have any kind of a, a structure sticking up off of a wing, that it creates vortex patterns and it also breaks up vor vortex patterns, depends on how it's designed. And so it's quite possible that this thing is, is, is going to be aimed like this upside down, and as the beetle's flapping it, it's creating a, a vortex structure underneath it and one possibility of, of things going on. We know from Schauberger and a couple other things that vortex, vortexing ether will create an, uh, gravity effects, anti-gravity. The other thing that I found was that these beetle wings have a very high electrostatic attraction when the cover is removed. So when you take this cover off, these underneath wings are extremely electrostatic. You know, they would, you know, when I would, uh, was lifting them up, they would want to stick to my fingers and everything else when I was trying to put them under the microscope. So it's quite possible that the uh, next one, quite possible that the wings act as a pro uh, producer of vortex motion and some kind of lift. The outer chitinous covering is plastic like, uh, and it's chitin and cellulose are extremely similar in atomic structure. Very little difference in them. I'll hit that in a minute. This, there's three types of chitin. Uh, chitin's the only naturally discovered occurring polyelectrolyte. There may be others, but uh, this is the only one that's ever been discovered in all of the research that uh, scientists have done. It's the second most abundant natural biopolymer in the world after cellulose, and both chitin and cellulose have similar atomic structures. Uh, arthropods and crustaceans, uh, for example, uh, exoskeletons of uh, both insects and 
uh, sea creatures, you know, like uh, crayfish and stuff like that, have uh, chitinous, chitin structures. There's three types here. You got alpha, beta, and gamma chitin. Uh, if you remember those stacked fanfold papers, this actually is, is similar to that. You know, they're, they're rotated, they're slightly, each, each uh, atomic array is, is rotated from the next one. And uh, that's a possibility of, of a uh, nanostructure that might work. And this is a uh, scientific example of it. Uh, here's the chitin itself. And these are the different layers, and they're all rotated very slightly from each other. So I don't know if Grabenikov had discovered the fanfold thing first and got into this, or, or he maybe was even unaware of this. But anyway, uh, they're called helicoidal, which is, means that successive molecular layers are rotated slightly from the previous layer. And this is uh, similar to Grabenikov's uh, discussion on the uh, fanfold papers. Cellulose itself is the most abundant natural biopolymer. Uh, all the trees and plant structure based on cellulose. His grab scooter is made of wood. Now, Jerry's made a, a big thing about the possibility that these uh, beetle wings or something were glued underneath the inside the platform and they were rotated around. Another possibility is that the wood itself uh, stimulated in a certain way would create a natural anti-gravity effect. There's a researcher in uh, Oregon named Dr. Orville E. Wagner, who's a physicist. He discovered that trees have gravitational interactions. He discovered that trees have reduced gravitational fields as high as a 20% reduction inside the tree. He would drill holes in the tree, put accelerometers in there, and measure up to a 20% uh, reduction in the gravity field. The wood cell size is in the range of gravitational frequencies for carbon and oxygen, which is the basic constituent of uh, both uh, chitin and cellulose, as well as uh, most other organic materials. Uh, this is all based on the uh, inertial speed of the gravitational waves and you know, the surface waves, which Wagner was able to measure as 96 centimeters per second times n, where n is some kind of an integer. Depending on the substance it's moving through, uh, depends on what the size of N is. This is the basic cellulose polymer. Conclusions. I hypothesize that the key to gravitation and free energy are large arrayed nanostructures. Now, all of the things you've seen discussed this morning used high voltage and electronics. I think it's quite possible that we can put together materials of a specific shape and size and modify the etheric energies to create macrogravity effects and gra macro free energy effects. Uh, I think Grubinikov's platform has tremendous potential. Uh, the, the gravitational effects are very dramatic and demand validation. Uh, I don't know, you know, it takes, probably gonna take a lot of research to figure this out, maybe not. Free energy effects may be possible with chitin characteristics. The other area that probably would scare the <coughs> bejabers out of most, most people, excuse me. You gargle, we're gonna kick you out. <laughs> okay. <coughs> the, the military effects of the grab scooter are unbelievable. <coughs> you figure if you gave every soldier in the military, one of these grab scooters, it gives the instant capability to move almost anywhere on the planet within a few hours. And of course, this means huge capability within the military to have troop movements. And just think of some crazy, like uh, some of these guys in the Middle East had this capability. So you can wonder why a lot of this stuff is not known today. It may be that it's just too dangerous to put out as far as a, um, a you know a, a scientific effect to apply and provide everybody one of these grab scooters, I think the helicoidal chitin is probably the most likely gravitational ray for a gra nanostructure. I, had, I think I had one other thing I wanted to read. This is from uh, Grabenikov again. 
he's, he's flying on the platform. It's a sultry summer day. The distance shimmers in a pale lilac blue heat phase haze over the fields and thickets. I am flying some 300 feet above the ground, taking for a reference point the distant lake, a bright elongated speck in the foggy haze. That's all I got, thanks. Any questions? Come up to the mic, would you please? On the diagram um, where he's uh, levitating on his scooter. Yes, sir. It shows the gravity closing in behind him. How did he know that that was occurring? Well, he, he could see that space was opening up in front of him and it was closing in behind him. In other okay. words, so he wasn't seeing, when he'd look back, the thing would be closing up and it would be opening up in front of him All when right. he was moving forward. That was when he would move forward. Any other questions? Uh, you just mentioned uh, uh, the, reson the resonant uh, frequency for gravity for carbon, and that was involved with the trees. Uh, I was just wondering how you found that resonant frequency for carbon and gravi gravitation. Okay. <clears throat> Through some research that uh, Jerry and I worked together on, uh, I was able to deduce the inertial frequency, and I'm talking about an inertial frequency of all atoms in the periodic table as well as any uh, ions and uh, subatomic particles. And that's how I know what the frequency of the uh, particles are. So we're stimulating uh, like these trees and things uh, that uh, Wagner talked about. The resonant frequency of the cells in the tree are the same resonance within the basic material, the atomic material that exists that those cells are made of. So when will your scooter be ready for demonstration? Uh, we're going to talk, uh, show that tomorrow. The <laughs> uh, question I have is uh, the uh, speed, height, stop, go, you know, lift, go down, how, how was all that controlled? Well, the the speed forward, we think, uh, in fact, I think the speed in all directions was due to leaning in some direction. Jerry thinks that possibly the uh, motorcycle handlebars allowed you to control the speed. Good possibility. And we're speculating a lot on this, and we don't know for sure. Uh, one of the reasons I think that it might be uh, just leaning in a direction is that when you lean, you're going to create a differential in the, the amount of force that's pushing on the local gravity field, so you'll tend to move in that direction. So if you're leaning forward, the thing will move forward. And I, I kind of think that the handlebar grips were something that would change the amount of lift that he had. It's just speculation. I just wanted to make a comment about the rhino beetle, because uh, I you know, published the anti-gravity newsletter. I was going to do a special issue on bio-gravitation, or bio-anti-gravitation. Um, uh, it was uh, published in the Journal of uh, uh, Biological Experimentation, uh, which is the, the, the biophysicist uh, research journal. And uh, the one thing, they had an anomaly with the rhino beetle. They found out it could carry 40 times its own weight. They actually put a little uh, cradle on top of the, uh, the beetle and put weights on it. <laughs> and normally when a human being, for example, uh, carries, uh, like if you weigh 200 pounds and you carry 50 pounds around, and you walk or just run, run along with that extra 50 pounds, your oxygen consumption, your energy, increases in proportion to what you're carrying. Right. Whereas in the rhino beetle, that did not occur. There was very, uh, like maybe a, a factor of four increase in its oxygen consumption and he was carrying four times, or excuse me, 40 times his own weight. Wow. And so it occurred to me that there might be some inertia nullification uh, going on in the rhino beetle. So you it might, sounds, uh, yeah. you know, it, look It into sounds that. like that, that there's more evidence to show yeah, that the in the mainstream literature, there, there is anomalies on their lift uh, capabilities of insects. Yeah, uh, talk to me afterwards. I'd like to get a copy of the article if you oh. know where it's from. Uh, the uh, one other point, one other point about beetles, 
it isn't just the rhino beetles underwings, it's all beetles that I looked at, and I looked at about five different species. They all have this strange uh, spiked array underneath, so it's quite possible that all beetles are out there levitating, unbeknownst to modern science, and violating all these laws of physics. Jerry. As much, I'm a big fan of Wagner, you know that. Yes. And I, I agree, great, great premise. And I blame myself. I did not send this to Dan. I should have scanned it in and sent it to him for his talk. This is Grabinikov's machine. Uh, honest, I mean, really, look at the bottom. And you can see the, the fans. Yeah. The, the, the fan shapes and how they open up and close. Yeah. And so it's not using the cell structure. Uh, this, I still think this is correct, but you know, you know your premise sure. is right. But it, it would explain the lift because uh -huh. so many of those uh, little uh, concavities will, based on that, it can lift 220 grams. If you add more, you could lift more. Sure. You know, because it's a matter of repulsion, plus the fact of uh, tilting. He says he, and, and I know you, you read it. He says uh, one of the left hand grips stick, or it was the left one in the left corner that the little fan thing sticked. He, yeah. he calls them fan blades in the in the translation. Uh huh. I, like I haven't seen that translation part of it. Yeah, I'll get you a scan of this, a real clean picture so okay. for your future. Because I, I really think this is the way it is. And it, it, it makes yeah. more sense because you can give not only height but also direction. And I agree with the, yeah. you know, the surfboarding the effect. The, so. the tilting, yeah. Exactly. But I'll get you. Yeah, this. it's all really neat stuff. Okay. Any other questions? Are you guys creeping up to talk or what? <laughs> Just one comment, I think it's very curious that you can go to the health food store and get a substance call, uh, called Kytosan that makes you lose weight. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is true. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Kytosan is, is made from chitin. Uh, I think they've treated it with an acid or something which changes its structure and it makes it very good for losing weight, supposedly. <laughs> I, I don't want to take it because I'm thin enough already. <laughs> Absorbs the fat. Absorbs the fat, Janine says. Okay. Uh, Dean Kamen is uh, building a scooter in, uh, I understand it has uh, gyroscopes on it, but there's some rumors going around that he may be adding some uh, anti-gravity things to it. Do you know anything about that? Now, who is this? Dean Kamen. He's from Massachusetts. Dean Kamen. No, that's a new one on me. Yeah, it's called Ginger. He's got a nickname for it. And I believe Steve Jobs and a few of those other people have invested quite a bit of money. He's actually building a plant now where he's going to be manufacturing these. Yeah. I, I guess I, I don't know anything about him. Uh, if you've got any information, I'd like to know about it. Revolutionary travel. Oh, that's, oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the, the guy that claims he's got this uh, uh, unknown energy thing or unknown device that is going to totally change the way people live in the yeah, cities. The way you design cities and everything. Yeah, I, like I don't think that's the same thing. I, th I think that is, is, is a, uh, some kind of a small uh, scooter that's based on normal technology. It's a gyroscopic unicycle. We've got the patents. It's all posted on Yeah. Gyroscopic unicycle. Jerry's got it all. I don't believe this will necessarily be a wet blanket on the thing, but if he can travel at 930 miles an hour at 1,000 feet, why is he still in Russia getting raising his entire family on $24 a month? Because he's in Russia. Sure. That's self-evident. He's very, he's very uh, ecologically sensitive. He does not want to see these bugs destroyed. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what he says. Yep. I know, you know, it's, it's quite possible. Like, Grabenikov is a real uh, environmentalist. And, okay, one more question. We've been talking about Reich and the ether and geometrics. I wonder if you have any comments on either Trevor Constable's work or Dan Winter's work. Trevor Constable, uh, yes, he's done a lot of work with the uh, Reich argon pipes and things like that, cloud busters and things, and it's basically ether engineering. What was the other, we had two uh, questions. Um, or if you were familiar with and had any comments on Dan Winter's work. Whose report? Dan Winter. Dan Winter, I don't know that one. Jerry, do you know that one? Dan Winter was involved in a lawsuit with Stan Tenen and lost the lawsuit big time, and he's absconded to Europe, and Stan's going after him to sue him and make him pay. Okay. <laughs> Jerry's got the answer. <laughs> okay. Thank you.
Is anyone is anyone doing any work on Joe cell work Joe's cell? Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. This is Dan Davison. He's going to show his gravity wave detector for the Kilonet Conference. Come on up, Dan. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, had a little bit of problem here with the scale equipment, and hopefully it'll stay working long enough for us to do a demo. Uh, what we've got here is, uh, if you see, you got that hooked up yet? Yes. Can you turn it on? There we go. Okay. Everybody turn on their head. Okay. What we've got here is the, uh, for this, for pins don't shoot light, but this one does. Uh, yes, sir. Everybody see that okay? Okay. Uh, what we've got here is a couple of speakers uh, putting out this particular frequency here, which is the uh, 51.287 hertz. And uh, what it's doing is uh, we've got a 9-volt uh, DC wall power supply driving a, a little signal generator that drives a 7-watt uh, amplifier that drives the two speakers. And the speakers are... Uh, out of phase between each other, so they're sort of setting up a standing wave in between them. And uh, we've got the, the gravity wave detector standing here on the scale. And the, the gravity wave detector is uh, basically uh, this thin tooth-like tooth thing here, which is uh, right in between here. And it's the uh, running on this little motor that'll run up to 10,000 RPM, but we're not running it quite that fast. We're, we're only putting out about uh, seven volts out of the power supply, which runs this thing at about, uh, I think, about 7,000 RPM. Uh, the way this thing is set up uh, in the experimental mode to run uh, 24 hours a day is that the output of the uh, meter puts out an RS-232 signal. And we run it over here to this uh, trans uh, converter that converts the signal. Looks when the when the scale gets upset, uh, this thing the, the RS232 turns off, and so this thing converts the on-off signal of the RS232 to a pulse, which goes in here to the pulse uh, counter. Is it on right now? I can't see it from here. It says 31. 31. Okay. Needs to be uh, well. If it's 31, you can at least remember what that is. Otherwise, I have to come around and set it up. So anyhow, I'm going to uh, turn on the motor and uh, let the thing build up. What this thing does when it builds up is uh, you can see the scale. Uh, I don't know. If, uh, can you? We can turn the overhead off now that you've. Uh, error 81. Is error 81 again? Oh, jeez. That's the problem we were having before. Let me turn it off. See if we can get it to reset. You might have to turn the machine off before it works. Oh, sorry. No. I think the vibration is causing it. To no, it, it, if it's working right, it won't do that. We had it working before the splatter stuff started happening. And then it uh, started acting weird, wouldn't uh, lock in. No, it's not coming up. There we go. 
Uh, can you all see the, the scale? It's uh, loose weight. It was set at tear to, to reset the scale so that it all weighed zero as far as the scale goes. And what it'll do is it'll sit here and, and gradually uh, lose some weight and then it'll stabilize after a while. What you're seeing right now is actually an anti-gravity phenomenon. It has nothing to do with these, this thing spinning here and creating a little bit of wind. The, the standing wave across here sets up the proper conditions to pick up uh, the local entrainment of the ether. And uh, how many pulses are on there right now? 37. 37, okay. But if you start seeing, like let me blow on the scale. Uh, you should see the pulses. Yeah. See, anytime you get a small upset on here, I think I got it set at five grams, but it, since it's traveling and stuff, it may have got reset to one gram upset. But every time it gets, the scale gets uh, an upset, which means it's no longer weighing correctly, it turns off the RS-232, which puts a pulse in here. So what we've done is we run this thing uh, all year long, and I go out there to the garage where the thing's running continuously, this whole experimental setup, and uh, I record the number of pulses that are coming out on this thing. Now, during the day, when you're not in a uh, high energy conduit, you'll get about uh, 900 to uh, 1500 pulses in a day. And when we get in an energy conduit, like the, around the 15th of December, this thing will get uh, several hundred thousand pulses a day. And you can actually come up here and watch the scale go uh, tremendously negative. It's, it's lost up to over 800% weight loss when uh, the, the thing is, when the whole scale and the earth is moving through a conduit. And right now what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out a way of simulating the, uh, the pulse energy that's coming in these conduits. And once we dot that, we got a space drive. There's just no doubt about it because of the amount of weight loss we're getting. But so you can see this thing spinning at a high rate of speed. All it is is, is some uh, teeth uh, on this little uh, PV, PC board material with uh, none of the teeth are electrically connected. If you connect the teeth, the thing won't work. And each tooth on the wheel is uh, made out of copper and it's the stuff that's left over after you etch the rest of the wheel away. And uh, both sides of the little wheel have copper on them, and they're moving around inside uh, these, these small magnets. You need a, uh, these are very weak uh, magnets that you can get at Radio Shack, and the, uh, you don't want to use strong magnets. When I first built this thing, I figured stronger is better. And what happens is, is the strong field uh, dampens out the anti-gravity effect and you don't get as many pulses. I was only getting maybe a few hundred pulses a day and when you moved into a conduit I was only getting a few thousand. So I sent the thing to Joe Parr and he found out immediately what was wrong. I had put too strong a magnets in it. So when he sent it back I mounted uh, new magnets on it uh, of the proper uh, gauss. I think they're about 100 gauss a piece and they're north, south, south, north all the way around. So none of the fields are opposing. Everything is, uh, the, the, the magnetic field is, is just alternating as you go around the wheel. So that when the wheel moves, it's moving in and out of an alternating magnetic field. Now, uh, I didn't do the experiment, but Joe had some experiments at work where you can put an alternating magnetic field across a pyramid itself and use the pyramid as a sensor. And this is all discussed in the uh, book. And of course the, the, the centrifuge, which is the preload to this experiment, uh, was, was the one that got the over 100,000 times increase in inertial power. What we're seeing here with, with the anti-gravity effects uh, is, is more than 800%. And the reason it's more than 800% is the scale goes uh, goes, out, goes out of calibration so quickly that you can't see anything on reading the scale beyond that. So we need a uh, different type of instrumentation to measure the actual amount of weight loss that we get out of the thing. Uh, basically, that's all there is to it. Uh, we're using a very, very fine wire here. I think this is number 32 wire so that so that any kind of uh, electrostatics that build up around here, which it does do, it builds up a big electrostatic field. I'm standing in it right now. 
And I don't know if anybody is clairvoyant in the audience or, or can feel feels, but if you come up here, you can actually feel the field in your hand as you move it closer to the machine. It's building up quite electrostatic field. And uh, we've had, uh, I had clairvoyant look at the energy that can see the energy in the field. And after it's run for a couple hours, it'll, the energy field fills the entire garage. And Joe Parr uh, had, uh, Bill Cox, who's one of the top dowsers in the world, who's doused many of the big uh, water wells for a lot of the big municipalities in California, and does uh, water dowsing you know, for individuals, uh, he doused the thing and saw the same energy fields that the clairvoyant, he, you know, Bill uses his dowsing instruments. The clairvoyant can see it, and Bill got the same thing using his dowsing seals. So that was kind of one in, input of information that we got off the thing that we even though I, I'm sensitive enough, I can feel the field as I get closer to it. Uh, a lot of people aren't sensitive enough to feel the fields. And one of the things that, that I tried to do when I first started out working on this back in the 50s was I realized that these, some of these guys that built this equipment were motor sensitives. So I've worked on uh, enhancing my own sensitivity. And so I, I can feel fields down into the uh, micro, uh, microvolt range and just around wires and stuff. And so it's quite easy for me to feel the fields as you move closer to it. I don't know if anybody uh, uh, can feel that kind of thing, but you might want to try it after, after I give my talk. You can come up here and uh, see if you can feel the field around it. And I'm getting all kinds of buzzing in my head from being around this thing. Uh, is there any questions about this? Because I'm going to move on to another thing. Be sure to come up and use the front mic so this gets on the tape for them. Dan, uh, is this uh, a, a pulsating uh, anti-gravity effect, pulsating or a continuous DC? It's a pulsing effect due to the way we're tapping into it. In other words, each triangle produces a little burst of force as it goes around no, between no, the poles, or is no, it? No, no, that's not the way it's working. Well, I mean, uh, not force, but I mean, it's, it's a weight loss, right? It's a, it, yeah, it's, it's, a, a, it's, it's a weight, a, either a weight loss or a weight gain, depending on the direction you spin the field and where uh, we are in the Earth's orbit. But uh, the, uh, what I'm saying is it's not continuous. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, like a dip depression in the weight. Okay. It's a, it's a, you, but it's pulsating. It's, okay, it's I, pulsating. I see where you're driving yeah, at. It's not, a, it's not like my Dean machine, my Dean machine. I, I understand. You're talking about it's a pulsating loss of weight. Yeah, what, what it is is when these energy, when you move into this conduit, the conduit is composed of, of particles of energy moving at an extremely high rate of speed. And when those particles come into this field, they interact and create a, uh, a bubble of energy around the triangle. Uh -huh. And this bubble of energy will get so stiff that it'll practically uh, bog the motor down each, each time one of these pulses hits these wheels. So uh, Joe has done a lot of more instrumentation on this than, than I've done. And what we've come up with, and, and he's proven it with the three-dimensional also, is, is what I mentioned yesterday, is that the, the pyramid shape itself builds a natural spherical force field around it. And so these little triangles we found have the same thing. They have a little spherical force field. And right now, we're in a very uh, low level uh, time within our orbit, plus the sun is highly active as far as its sunspot cycle. So we're not getting a lot of uh, energy from the, uh, the conduits because the sun's suppressing it. But you do get enough energy so you can measure the... What I was conduit. leading up to was instrumentation exactly. Uh, if it's a not a s smooth effect, uh, you might want to consider using some piezo film rather than use a weigh scale. Just put some piezo film underneath your your board there, and uh, the piezo film will put out a put out a spike force every time you stress it. If you've got a pulsating stress on that film, and you can put it on a scope, and you'll see the the force. The yeah. weight change effect uh, on the scope with the piezo film, right, <laughs> and yeah. you can get that from a company called Amp Incorporated. A okay. M. Yeah. Film. What, what he's talking about is uh, instead of using the scale is, is to set the experiment on some piezoelectric material and then measure the output of the piezoelectric material. And this is an inexpensive way to run the experiment. This scale is quite expensive. It's about $1,500 and you can't even buy them anymore. Uh, the uh, O-House, or the company that made these, I think it's O-House, 
uh, sold out to another, comp another scale outfit, and the other scale company decided they didn't want to mess with these expensive scales. But it's the only scale that has a fast enough response time for us to pick up the pulses. So uh, you're probably going to have to go use something like the piezo effect or find a scale that has a very high uh, speed response time to measure a lot of this pulse stuff. <clears throat> what happens if you increase the RPM? Does it make it more of an effect? No, right now it's tuned to the best RPM to pick up the effect. And what happens Increasing if it doesn't increase the effect. Not right that now. much. No. What, uh, if you completely get rid of the speakers, will it work somewhat? If you what? If you get rid of the speakers completely, will the uh, motors, um, will it work? Uh, yeah. Does it still have some effects? It has a minor effect, but not near as much. So, uh, when, when this experiment was first built, we didn't use the speakers. Yeah. We, used the, we set up a uh, negative ion generator here, and it built up a field which was enough to cause the experiment to be triggered. And it was not an electrostatic effect or anything like that. It was just that that kind of a stress field from the electrostatics was necessary for this to happen. And we're creating a stress field uh, tuned to this particular gravitational matrix that's set up in the experiment. But you're still not getting natural effects from uh, the cosmos or whatever the planet passes through, right? Well, how much weight have we lost? We're up to 38, 39. It's on a plus now. It goes through a, a cycle, and we just may be in a location here where the, the weight is increasing on it. But uh, what we can do, well, I don't want to mess with the scale. My, screw it up again. <laughs> but uh, that's really the, uh, we found the best way to do a lot of measurements because you can hook the output of the scale to an oscilloscope and, uh, or a counter, and not a counter, but an oscilloscope where you can measure the pulse widths and everything and, and we've been doing some measurements on that have to you characterize the pulses. Have you all done experiments like uh, changing the size of the magnets width the size of the triangles. I, I don't quite understand you. Uh, uh, like making bigger triangles, smaller magnets, or larger magnets, smaller triangles. Have you done any experiments with the size of the yes. triangles? Yeah, there's been some experiments on this. This one was designed to be <coughs> a uh, harmonic relationship of the side of the Great Pyramid. I see. It's, it's an op obviously the Great Pyramid is, is over 45 stories high, so it's quite a small uh, scale replica of the side of the pyramid. But you can make them larger, uh, but then you've got to retune the magnets and everything else uh, to make it work right. You can buy these magnets at Radio Shack, these little button magnets, and that's the kind we use. You know, very inexpensive magnets. I think they're like 20 cents a piece or something. Any other questions on this one? Then I'm going to turn it off and uh, show you a couple of other shape power effects. I can't hear you. You got to come up to the mic if you're going to talk. Is that it? What are we looking at? <laughs> what are we doing? I'm lost. I thought somebody else had another question. Oh. I heard somebody mumbling back there. No, no. Okay. We were talking about you, not to. That's fine. That's fine. I ignore all that stuff. <laughs> all right, we'll turn this puppy off here. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, the basic shape power discovery. Remember I discussed the, uh, that we can actually measure the fields that the pyramid generates. This is a stack of uh, paper pyramids here. Uh, they were, uh, let's see, if, how many pyramids we got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, about 15 of them, roughly. So uh, what, I, what we have here, I don't want to move it, but this is a flux gate magnetometer. And here on the table, I've got it oriented so that I can get the maximum sensitivity off the uh, magnetometer. And it, what it does, it measures in gammas. And the conversion uh, from uh, to, to gammas is 0.32. 385, well, it's 0 0.32385 Orsteds per volt, and there's 10 to the fifth gammas per Orsted. Okay? So let's 
plug this thing in. All right, let's see if this thing's gotten moved a little bit. Okay, that's good enough. Well, there must be some fluctuating magnetic fields around here. It's all you electrical folks, that's what it is. Uh, what's the best way for you to see the scale? Just set it down like that. Okay. Now I'm going to, we should see a little bit of change. Is it changing any? Yeah. That's paper creating a magnetic field. It's strictly shaped. And we, I've done a lot of precise experiments and measurements of this, and it's discussed in the book. Yeah. Did it go away? Did it drop back down? I, I can't see. Uh, yeah. One of the things we found is that uh, there's hysteresis in the ether. Uh, when you first run this experiment, it starts building up a local field, and it, it works better in some locations than others. But uh, if you try and move the experiment to another location, uh, the experiment quits working for a while till it builds up a new local uh, set of conditions for, that, for the thing to operate properly. Now, let's see, these are, these are actually the same shape as the Great Pyramid. They're small models. And they've got uh, a lot of uh, lines on them drawn with an ink, inkjet printer, or actually a laser jet printer in this case. And I checked into the uh, magnetization of the inkjet printer. It has no iron particles or anything in it that would cause a magnetization or any type of other uh, possible ferrous uh, magnetic materials. And these were, this was an example. You can see the field dropping down. Uh, one of the things that we found with shape power is that you can draw figures on a piece of paper and create energy effects. And John Keeley was famous for walking up to the chalkboard, drawing some figures on the board, and his machines would start operating. And nobody ever figured out what was really happening. Well, what Keeley had done was he had discovered that by creating energy, moving energy on a chalkboard and setting up a field actually was uh, enough energy to trigger what he wanted to do with his experimental apparatus. And this, this is a good example of, of a, a pyramid with, with shapes on it that focus the energy down here at the corners. Because if you remember the, uh, well, maybe I didn't talk about it yesterday, but uh, there was a, uh, a lot of experiments that I did. The initial experiment was two, two lines together that would uh, create a magnetic field in between them. Well, if you have a bunch of lines stacked up, it increases the amount of magnetic field. And that's really what's happening right here is that you see a whole bunch of lines coming in here and converging down here at the corner of the pyramid on both sides. So you're, you're creating a, an excess amount of magnetic field here, which is measurable with the flux gate mag. Back to uh, any questions on that part of it? Can you move one more time? Oh, sure. Down just below the box. Down right here? Right here? Now it went up. It's my magnetic personality. Can I move behind the box? Right here. You got to get it at the right point.
It's going up right now. But anyhow, you got to get the, you get the idea. Let's see what this one does. Have you done any experimentation in regards to the Hebrew alphabet? Uh, no. In regards to this? Yeah, the, the Hebrew alphabet is uh, shape power also, but I've never done anything with it. It's, uh, they've, if you get on, I think, what's, do you know what site it is that they have? There's, there's a site out where the guy's taken the entire Hebrew alphabet and, pardon? I, I still didn't hear you. Stan Tannen, yeah, Stan Tannen has got a website out there and what he did was he took all of the characters in the Hebrew alphabet and did a math analysis of them and found out that they were different views of a logarithmic spiral, which is quite fascinating, which means that somewhere way back uh, when there was a more advanced technology that could, uh, that was kind of predating ours that was advanced enough to, to work out all the mathematics and, and come up with an alphabet that is tuned uh, to the logarithmic spiral or has different uh, geometric views of it. Okay, any questions on the goofy pyramid stuff? Yeah, come and get a mic. I just had a, had a, um, I, I notice you've got a speaker pretty near to your pyramids. Would that one speaker affect it with its magnetic fields? Yeah, you know, if I move this thing up here, it would, because there is I mean, where, where it's relative to where you've placed it, if it's omnidirectional. <coughs> Your, uh, so yeah, but it was with this. See, what I did was I oriented this here to minimize the amount of field coming off of it. Right. Okay. And uh, so then when I put these close to it, you could see some effects. So it was basically uh, zeroing out any effects from the magnet, the the big magnet okay. that's in the speaker. Right. Sure. If I move this thing up, in fact, here I'll show you. Uh, just uh, I'll crank the the meter up again. And just to show you, uh, let's see, I'll probably I'll put this on a different scale. Put it farther forward on the table. Here? Yeah, put it in front of the machine. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to move this. You want it over here? Yeah, just so it's a little closer to the, so to we can see the pyramid. Oh, okay. Uh, if you rotate this around, this is what they use, uh, in uh, directional compasses in your Mercedes Benz, as they use a flux gate magnetometer to get the direction of the Earth. And you can see as you move it around, it'll go through a tire uh, 360 degree voltage change. Now it's going negative as you get around to the other side. And this, so this is just a fancy compass. You know, it's measuring very sensitive uh, level of magnetic field. But this, they use uh, flux gate magnetometers for uh, directional, uh, detailed directional systems to get the local magnetic field direction that you're operating in. They use it, they do a lot of magnetic field measurements and they use flux gate mags a lot. This is a homemade one. The guy that made these uh, provided me with uh, the circuit diagrams and the, the flux gate mags. Uh, he was selling a kind of a kit on the internet the kit basically was the, the flux gate magnetometer sensor and the plans. And through a lot of communication with him, I was able to get the circuit up and running and it works pretty good. But a, a good flux gate mag will cost you several thousand dollars if you want to buy a good one for yourself for the laboratory and you got the bucks. Question? Do uh, pyramids exhibit any, time, uh, any anomalous anti-gravity effects? In other words, does a pyramid change weight? Uh, also, I read in one of the original pyramid books that uh, uh, the apex, if you put a pendulum 
near the apex of uh, a pyramid, it's, it's repelled. You cannot center a pendium over a pyramid. Do you know anything about that? I don't know. I haven't seen that effect. We've played a lot with the pyramids, and I haven't seen that. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the thing is, is that when the uh, at certain times of the year, the force field around the pyramid builds up. So it, during, during certain times of the year, you may be able to test it. The problem with most of the pyramid researchers, when they started researching this stuff, they didn't know that there was any effects across the entire year that would affect it. And it turns out that the maximum time of year is around December 15th to uh, January 12th or 15th, somewhere in that time frame. There's another big one in June, and there's some small ones in May and, and, uh, and a couple other places. That it was in the Shape Hour book. So uh, to right now, to just stick a pendulum over the pyramid and see if there's any effect, unless that force field is built up enough, you're not going to see any effects. But because that force field is opaque to all local forces. And what that statement means is that that force field does not transmit or receive any known force like gravity, uh, magnetism, uh, radiation from nuclear radiation, particle phenomena, or anything. I mean, that, that force field is totally complete and opaque to local forces, which makes it an ideal uh, force field to go traveling around the universe in because you're not going to be affected by a local inertia or anything else. You know, if gravity doesn't go through it, then the local inertia effects of somebody inside that field uh, doesn't exist. You're not going to feel this being slammed against the thing when you accelerate off someplace. Does that also mean if you're inside of that, since time is gravity, that you would not age? I don't know. I'm over 300 years old. That's true. I <laughs> <laughs> If you got, do you believe that? I got some land for sale, and maybe even a bridge. A day older than what? <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, this was a little uh, device. Uh, after reading Grabenikov, he discussed the effects of the uh, the bee honeycomb was a very healing effect. So what I did was I made a small honeycomb here, this thing radiates like crazy. But uh, if you want to come up here and, and run the thing over your hand or something, see if you can feel anything out of it, uh, you can give it a try. But Grabenikov said that there were, he, he tested all kinds of shapes and their healing effects and found out that the honeycomb was one of the very few that had any positive effects. And he found that some of the other shapes did not have a, a positive effect as far as your health and well-being goes. Now, one of the things we found with the uh, shape power research is that there are a lot of shapes out there that are not very constructive. So when you do a lot of this research, you want to be uh, sensitive enough to know whether the shapes you're move messing with uh, are good, bad, indifferent, whatever. So that's, uh, oh, what, what that? Maybe we've said it here. One of the shapes that's quite interesting is uh, <laughs> what's this? <laughs> Zap! <laughs> These batteries running out. But this this particular shape here, I don't know if you can uh, get it uh, cl uh, close up, but it, it's the same one that's on the cover of the uh, Shape Power book. And it, what it is, it's a 12-pointed uh, tesseract. And a tesseract... Tilt it, turn it tilt just so the light gets on it. Uh, turn it, yeah, there you are. Okay, 12-pointed okay. tesseract is where you draw lines from uh, 12 points that are setting on the circumference of a circle to every other point in the circle. So as you go around this thing, you get this uh, uh, nest of uh, intercrossing and, and uh, waves. And this particular... Uh, pattern is very constructive. What it does is it fills the entire room with uh, multicolored energy just flashing all over the place. And this was seen by the clairvoyant. You know, I, whether you believe in clairvoyance or not, uh, I was able to prove that, that she's, you know, I used to work for a human factories company, so I learned how to test a lot of these people. And uh, she was extremely good at uh, measure, you know, seeing some of these energies. This is a good uh, constructive form. And if you're sensitive, you can feel the constructive energy off of it. Uh, one other tool.
toy. This, this one, we never got working, but it's, uh, I think it's because I did not uh, use the right material. Grabenikoff says that you can set up a, 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 a stick of wood that is charred, so it's mostly charcoal, and, and use it as a detector of energies. And this one, I could not get to work, but he, he mentioned several materials. One was a, a straw of sorghum, uh, and the other was a, uh, a piece of carbon rod. And I thought I could make a carbon rod with this, but I don't think I charted enough or something to give any effect. But uh, if some of you want to try building yourself a simple detector to measure these subtle energies, maybe you can get something like this working. Any other uh, questions? Well, uh, really, it's just a comment. Uh, in Charles Cosimano's uh, Psionics, uh, his, his first book, he uh, detailed a detector that you can make out of a plastic straw, like from McDonald's. You just uh, heat up a, a sewing needle with a lighter, and you get yourself a little hole in, in one side of the middle of the straw. And you stick that needle uh, <laughs> not so hot through uh, a piece of cardboard, and then you just balance the straw on the needle uh, through it that's being supported by the cardboard. Uh, I did this, and it's very easy to get an electrostatic effect. Mm -hmm. It spins, usually. Um, it's easy to get a distance effect by staring at it. But I also put a very thick uh, glass bowl over on top of it to minimize any wind or uh, try to minimize some static electricity effects. It still spun really rather easily because it's very delicately balanced on this needle. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. I don't know, you know if it's anything <laughs> that, that we can uh, get a serious, uh, serious quantification from, but it's just, a, just something m maybe you guys can play with. Yeah. What, what, did he use a straw? Is that what you said? A straw and a needle? A, a straw, a McDonald's straw, and a sewing needle, and a piece of cardboard to okay. stick the needle through. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was it a paper straw or a uh, plastic straw? I think plastic is important. Okay. But brand probably not. All right. <laughs> That's good. I mean, you know, there's a lot of simple things like that that you can come up with that'll uh, allow you to measure some of these energies. I was fortunate enough to be able to figure out the uh, creation of the magnetic field with a shape effect, and then build an instrument that was sensitive enough to actually measure it. Is there anything else? Any other questions? That's all I got for now. Thank you very much.